Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hammer Podcast. Today is November 27th, 2020, and I am speaking with Nicole. Nicole went to the Victory Christian Academy in Jay, Florida, correct? Jay, yes. Florida. From October 1996 to late March 1997. So we're going to go ahead and give the floor to Nicole, and she's going to uh, tell us her story. Go right ahead, Nicole. The floor is yours. Yeah, well, I'm... 41 years old now <laughs> and uh, I just kind of accidentally did some research and stumbled upon all these survivors and I, I reached out to you and a few other people and I've gotten just this wonderful response back of all these girls that want to tell their stories and yeah. I've ever <laughs> since I left the place I've always wanted to do something about it Right. And uh, it's just so what it's finally happening. <laughs> why did you why, why were you sent there to begin with? Well, I left my mother and stepfather here in Illinois, which is where I am now. And I went down there to live with my father and his wife, my stepmother. And when I got there, I had had a lot of problems because I wasn't I was being abused by my mother and my stepfather. And so I went there to kind of escape that, thinking, you know, I could start over and things would be different. And basically a very messed up 13-year-old girl got put on my father's doorstep. Mm. And I was given a key to the house and a room and told to stay out of trouble. And that was pretty much it. And <laughs> it, it was nothing I was used to at all because... You know, at my mother's house, it was always, you know, walking on eggshells and and watching what you did and said and just constantly nervous and paranoid. And, and you know, more I think about it, it was kind of good training for victory <laughs> and how to handle <laughs> tense situations. Right. But it, it just, uh, I had a, a lot of severe depression and anxiety and nightmares and I just wasn't doing well in general, adapting to life with my father in Florida. And I asked him to get me into therapy and he said it was stupid and useless and things got worse. And I tried to kill myself, not once, but twice. And the third time I got sent to the hospital after that, I had turned 16 by the last time I was in the hospital and he uh, was told by the doctors that were treating me that I needed residential treatment okay. and so what it what had happened was is I'm not sure exactly how or what happened but I was mowing the lawn one day and my stepmother took off with the my little brother that she just had, he, I think he was about one or two. And she said she wasn't coming back home until I was gone mm. to my father. And I stayed at home for two or three weeks and didn't go to school. He ordered pizzas and had him sent to the house and I was completely alone. And then he comes back and says, you're going to this place and they'll help you. And, and, you know, it's just so pack up your stuff and we're going to leave in two days. Were your parents, so, were your parents religious? Uh, were they Baptists or, or what did I had, were they? Up here in Illinois, I had gone to a, a Lutheran school for pretty much everything but seventh and eighth grade. And I'm, you know, I'm very familiar with the Bible and the catechism and, and, uh, you know, we didn't go to church very much except every you know, small occasion, and uh, that, that's about it. There's no real religion in the family, and in my father's case in Florida, he, he never went to church. He smoked pot. He drank a little bit, and, you know, he, I never knew him to be a religious person, and then all of a sudden, one day, 
we start going to this church <laughs> and it, it was right by the ocean and so every sunday morning i have to get up and go to church and get dragged to church and i absolutely hated it because it just wasn't my thing but they had become born again christians and for whatever reason yeah. and and then uh the last time i got put in the the psych ward there was a a girl there and i didn't know her but my father would come in for the the family therapy type thing and the best i can figure out is that my father talked to this other girl's parents and that's how he found out about it because when i got to victory in j florida that girl was there oh okay and i put two and two together and i'm like there that had to have been the connection of where he found this place is because that same girl was in the right. same psych ward in florida and then it's like i know you because <laughs> i know it's an independent fundamental baptist because it's all it all stems like i said the epicenter like when i talked to you before the the epicenter was, was <laughs> sorry the epicenter was lester roloff so you know what i mean he was the one that started it and roloff was independent fundamental baptists so yes. so uh did they did somebody take you there did a car come up to your house and grab you and put you in the back seat and take you there or did your parents take you there or how's that story uh well my dad yeah. eventually came home and talked to me and and, and said that i was going to go to residential treatment he said it was going to i was going to stay there for maybe a year maybe less maybe more and so i thought it was going to be a legitimate mental health service type right. place where you live and uh so I was, well, the hospital's not that bad. I've been in and out of it so many times. And uh, so I was, you know, not fighting it at all. And my, he said, pack up your clothes and stuff. And he drove from West Palm Beach, Florida to J, Florida. And then my mother here in Illinois drove down from Illinois to J, Florida and met there. Okay. And that's how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so you get there. So you, you, uh, I guess you had some sort of orientation, or they just kind of walked you through the the process, or not at all. Not at all. There was no process at all. We got there, walked through the main doors, which were locked, and. Uh, immediately they said tell your parents goodbye give them a hug and a kiss there's my dog Barker <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I was like okay and immediately I knew something was wrong okay. all, these, all these girls weren't talking they weren't saying anything they weren't looking at me and they were all wearing blouses and full-length skirts and dresses and dress shoes and it didn't look anything like a hospital or a residential facility for mental health care. It, it was completely different. Okay. And so, you know, I'm, I hugged my mom and, you know, said bye to my dad. And then I got whisked away to a bathroom in the original part of the house in the back. There were two girls called helpers in there, and Miss Betty came in, the staff member, and she said, strip. And I'm like, for what? <laughs> and she says, well, we don't, we don't allow T-shirts or pants. You can't wear any clothing right. with, with print on it, and it has to be female attire. And you'll never wear pants while you're here. And I'm like, well, all I own are shorts and pants. <laughs> So strip search oh. began, and they took my clothes and my shoes because I had uh, combat boots on, and um, they told me to take a shower, but there was no soap or shampoo in there, so I just got wet, and uh, came out, and they had laid out this god-awful skirt and this shirt and <laughs> tights. Tights. I'm like, I'm like. 
how do I even put these on? I've never worn pantyhose or anything. And then they had this pair of bright red, they were either four or six inch heels. And I'm like, I can't wear those. Oh. I've never worn heels in my life. And they just snapped off real quick. Well, it's the first two weeks, all the new girls have to wear heels. So I attempted it and ended up spraining both my ankles to where they bruised. And then they found a pair of uh, women's flats. And I wore those for two weeks. Oh. Maybe the reason why they wanted you to wear heels is so you wouldn't run. Yeah. Maybe. That's pretty much the reason I was thinking, too. Of course, I have seen some women run pretty fast in heels. <laughs> Not me. I, no. <laughs> I, 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 I was pretty much a tomboy all my life. It was, you know, boots and sneakers. And, you know, I wore dress shoes once in occasion, but they usually were men's dress shoes. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that, that's, that's the independent fundamental Baptist. Girls can't wear <laughs> pants. All they can wear is skirts down to below the knee, I believe. Yeah. And flat shoes, blouse, yep. maybe a little tie, depending on, on the place. Uh, yeah, the uh, the Kissels, Mr. and Mrs. Kissel, who were, I can't even begin the degree to, to tell you the degree of how awful those people were. <laughs> but Mr. Kissel was... The uh, principal, right. kind of, of the schooling section. And then his wife was, I guess, co-principal. I'm not sure. Assistant principal, it, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. It, they were they were nasty. They were just not nice people. <laughs> <laughs> so were, were you uh, paired together with somebody else to kind of show you around or? Uh, well, what happened after the strip search in the shower, uh, Miss Betty explained to me the buddy system, and I guess because of my, my history of trying to hurt myself, they had immediately put me on double buddy. So I had two of them. Two of them? Wow. <laughs> Special. Yeah, I had two of them. Special. All right. <laughs> yeah. And I was told that at the times we were allowed to speak, which was far and few between we were never allowed to talk or have a conversation with anybody that I was only allowed to speak to my helpers okay and you know most of the helpers had been brainwashed to a point that was just so unbelievable they had swallowed all of this hook line and sinker <laughs> and they some of the girl helpers were just as bad as the staff I mean it was it was well, you know, you, you got to do what you got to do to survive. You know, I know some girls that I've talked to, they falsely proclaimed that they were saved just to get through yeah. the program. You know what I mean? But there were actually some, and I think some of them actually came, their parents were probably in, in that uh, religion, the Baptists. So they grew up in that. So they were probably mm -hmm. already brainwashed before they even went to the school. Or maybe there were some that were actually converted. I mean, it happens, you know, it happens. There was, there was one girl, she was 18, and I believe she had been there for four years. Wow. And I had defied them the entire way. I, I did not believe in this. I didn't believe in this system. And then, you know, the compounding of the, the mental health issues I was having. And... We, uh, there's this one main hall. It's the chapel, it's the schoolroom, it's the dining hall, it's everything. And we set up the tables and chairs and take them down six times a day. And they, uh, we were, we were eating lunch. And, uh, this girl got a letter, you know, delivered to her by Miss Betty. And this girl had been there for four or five years and, she opened it and started crying. And to those of us, was, you weren't allowed to notice. You know, if it was lunchtime, you focused on your food. You weren't allowed to notice anything that was going on, whether it was a right. fight, a beating, someone getting screamed at. You know, you just focused on what you were doing. And, you know, but it had gotten 
whispered around a little bit by those of us who were kind of being subversive and communicating that it was a letter from her parents in California. And there was a plane ticket in there. They wanted her to come home. And I couldn't understand why she got so upset and was crying. I thought, well, maybe she's happy. You know, she's going to go home. Right. Tears of joy. Yeah. Well, that wasn't it. She ripped up the letter and she ripped up the plane ticket. And then when we later went around again, the whispers, and, and found out why, she was terrified of going back into the real world and sinning and going going to hell. Oh. She was so scared of going into the world, as it was called, yeah. that she couldn't leave this place. She didn't she was so convinced that if she went home, the world would, you know, seep back into her and destroy her and she would be going to hell. And she was probably also she was probably also afraid that the world has changed. You know, she's been in there for four years. It's like it's like a, a a prisoner getting out of parole or whatever after let's say 10, 15 years and everything is just completely different. You know, how do you cope with it? You know, it is. She's it comfortable, is. she's comfortable in that environment. And to go out of that environment into something else that's totally foreign to her. That's, yeah. that could be a scary situation. You know? Yeah, it, it's just the level of indoctrination right. with some of the girls was just. Plus, plus the fact that she thought, you know, if she sunk back into the world and did the worldly thing, she was going to go to hell. That's another thing. They just beat that hell philosophy oh, into you. Oh, my goodness. Every, every sermon, <clears throat> hellfire, brimstone, you're all horrors, you're all sluts, you know, it, He'd pick out, Michael Palmer would pick out the girls that had tattoos and the ones that weren't, you know, you know, it was on their shoulder or right. below the knee. He'd be like, stand in front of the group, show them your shame, show them how much you, you've damaged the temple of God mm. with this, with this filth and make a total point out of someone who had like a couple of hearts tattooed on their ankle or a butterfly. Right. <laughs> Something and, harmless, yeah. Yeah. Well, it does say in the Bible not to mark yourselves. So, and like, it's, and of course, it's the King James Bible. That's yep. the only Bible around. All the other Bibles are the devil's work. Yep. So, yeah, I, had, I remember him going on and on. It's like the there's somewhere in the King James Bible that says the seventh version of this book is the only true version of the book, and it just. Just yeah. random nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, I think if they had actually read the Bible all the way through, I think a lot of them probably wouldn't have been Christians. I mean, some of the horrors that's in there, some of the stuff, I, I mean, I don't understand why women even are actually following the Bible, because the Bible degrades women, basically. Yeah, it doesn't project women in a very good no, light at all. it doesn't. They're worth half half to the man, you know what I mean? Yep. It's, I don't know. But somehow they yeah. get them to believe it. Yeah, so. we, that was one of the big things there at Victory was he'd get on his podium, Michael Palmer and, and Brother Kissel, I don't know his first name, and uh, it was only the men that were allowed to preach. Yeah. And uh, they would just go and and quote these verses from the Old Testament about a woman's place and subjugation to man and oh, yeah. to not have free will and it also it it's God's plan and this is how God wants us to live and it says in the I'm Bible just, that that women aren't allowed to talk in church yeah they're not allowed yeah. to teach so if they have a question they have to wait till they get home and talk to their husband in private and ask him the question. That way he can ask the pastor. They yep. get the answer. I mean, it's just complete horseshit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's man-made. But, hey, yeah. you know, uh, like I said, the guy that started all this, Lester Roloff, he was, he believed the Bible literally. Oh, yeah. Okay. Everything in that book is all you need. 
mm-hmm. to, to, to 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 have keep your life, you know, to to, to run your life basically. And you that's run it by the, that book. That's one of the things they mm-hmm. did because I had brought a couple of suitcases and a box of things with me from home, thinking I was going to do something completely different. Right. And they were going through all of my stuff. Basically, I got to keep a few pairs of socks, a couple of pairs of underwear that were white. We could not have or wear anything that was black. There were no shirts like, you know, what I'm wearing, my Alice in Chains shirt. None of this at all. No print. Um, There are certain colors you couldn't wear, like black or red. And Yeah, well, black, we all know why black. Yeah. that's, that's, That's a given right there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and so I had, like, nothing to wear because I didn't own a skirt, a dress. I didn't own any of that. So you got the it's, hand-me-downs. Exactly. Secondhand, secondhand stuff, yeah. Yeah, they have a whole closet full of dresses and skirts. They're all ugly as hell. <laughs> and I got put, because I was, I was a little bit of a bigger girl back then, and... I'm just like wearing this kind of a dull lime green full length floor dress on my first day of of being there. And I'm like, lime green. (laughs) It's just what in the hell? Where am I? And, you know, I, I went to my helper and I'm just like, what the fuck is this place? I says, I'm, I'm not understanding this. Boom. Right away. The, the one tells me to sit down. The other one sits like practically on top of me. And then they go and they get, you know, Michael Palmer and Miss Betty. And he looked at me and Miss Betty stared at me and said, did you just swear in the house of the Lord? And I said, yeah, I don't fucking understand. Bam. Right across the face. Oh. Knock my glasses off and everything. Says we do not take the Lord's name in vain. We do not swear, and that's when I got my first notebook and my first pen, and I was taught what writing lines were, <laughs> and I got lines about speaking the Lord's name in vain and swearing, and they just are you kidding me? I tell you, oh, oh, to be a fly on the wall in Michael Palmer's house, because I, <laughs> I can. I, I, I don't know for certain, but I know the way I know preachers and, and these guys that call themselves men of God, they're one thing when they're in public mm-hmm. and they're a complete other thing when they're in private. And just to be, like I said, a fly on the wall and just to see what Palmer does or did, I think he's dead now, but what, yeah. he, what he did, he probably swore, smoked, drank. For him. I'm sure he did a lot of things that he said not to do. Oh, yeah. So, oh. Yeah, there was one sermon I remember in particular. He had supposedly just gotten his doctorate finished in whatever. I'm not sure. Probably theology. But he, was, he had gotten a credit card that said Dr. Michael Palmer. <laughs> and he took somebody, I can't remember who, out to lunch or dinner and he paid with that card. Oh. Now, Chase, Florida is a really, really small, small country town. It's kind of like close-knit. Everyone knows everybody from what I can gather. Okay. And when he went to pay for the bill, he gave him that new credit card. And she's like, oh, you're a doctor. Oh, what do you do? I work with children. Oh. How, what do you, what, are you a surgeon? Or what do you... This is, I help fix children's hearts. And he went on and, and like gave us this whole spiel that he gave the, the, the checker lady at this restaurant saying he was a doctor of the heart. And I'm like, dude, yeah, pushing knives through it. I mean, <laughs> I yeah. mean it, was, it was like, what are you, Whoever gave you a doctorate needs an, uh, a lobotomy. You should have said he should have said he was a brain surgeon. He fucks up kids' minds. Exactly. Basically. <laughs> you know, I was I was like sitting there that day with a look on my face, and I was just you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
were were you restrained at all? Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, the helpers were were well versed in. Uh, I called it body checking because I like hockey. Uh huh. And oh yeah, they were taught how to sweep a leg and kind of grab you by the arm and like force you down and flip you around at the same time. Pressure points. And yeah. And uh, it, it, it was so strange because it's like. You're just like me. Why are you helping them? And they would they would sit on you and pin you to the floor and scream at you. And if you didn't calm down and accept your, you know, three million lines that you were going to write. And then uh, they took you into Brother Kissel's office. And that's where the get right room was. Oh, the get right room. Yes. Yeah, which was just it was basically think of like a walk-in closet for your like your coats when you come into your house. That's about mm-hmm. how big it was. And I'm and, sure you spent many a many a times there. Oh yeah, and it smelled wonderful. And <laughs> is an and is an act of protest. You know, I never asked to go to the bathroom. I went right there in the oh. corner. <laughs> number 1 and 2. <laughs> Good and, for you. <laughs> uh, I I was like, fine, leave me in here. I don't care. Yeah. You know, it was just, you know, there was, it was, I realized very early on, there was no way out. All the doors were dead bolted and all the windows had alarms on them. At night, they set a security system and there were no fire doors. Even the fire doors had dead bolts on them. And... Even if you could get away from your helper and get outside of the building somehow, you're surrounded by woods on one side and just cotton fields on the other. And the road in front of the place didn't have hardly any traffic. So you got out. It was like, where are you going to go? Yeah, you're You don't on know your own. where you are. You don't know where to go. And on top of that... He used to threaten me specifically and a few other girls, Michael Palmer did, that, you know, another girl had said, well, I'll just go on run. It was called going on run. And he's like, go, he would have these whole sermons prepared. It's like, go ahead, go ahead, run, leave this place if you think you can get out there. But remember, my sons are the county sheriffs. And if you think what I'm doing to you is wrong, wait till my sons get a hold of you. And he would talk about his his sons, and it was like, does he even have children? I, we didn't know if it was a lie or a bluff or or what, uh-huh. but it was it was enough to terrify a lot of us. Right. Because it's like at least here, there's witnesses. We leave and run away, and he really does have sons that are sheriffs. I don't want to know what they would do to us. Uh, I mean, that's that was more scary than. What's terrifying? You know, what's terrifying is the fact that he procreated. Oh, yeah, more of them. <laughs> uh, there was actually a woman out there, who who looked at him and said, "You know, I want my kids to look just like him." <laughs> oh God! <laughs> With that stupid cheesy grinny smile. <laughs> <laughs> you know that that was his thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was he had this grin that he would do, and it was just, you know, you if you rolled your eyes at him, you know, that was worth a you know a backhand or more lines or more stupid forced labor chores. Did you have to do? Um, uh, did you have to do calisthenics? You have to do jumping jacks and push ups and all that stuff. Uh, they never made us really do any of that except for the half an hour during the the bullshit pace school thing where they'd make us go run around the two pecan trees in the front corner of the property. Yeah. And, you know, we'd go run around the trees for 20 minutes and then go back to class. And, and the, my problem was is that, you know, when I even when I was younger, like, you know, seven and eight, I have uh, IBS, you know, irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. And uh, I get uh, UTIs frequently. And it's just no one's ever figured out why, but stress-induced and, you know, they tell me that. 
and during school time, you can't go to the bathroom. And it was usually three to four hours long. And, you know, I'm sitting there holding everything, sweating, just trying to hold everything. And I go up to Mrs. Kissel's desk and you're like, I really have to go to the bathroom. And, no, take your seat. And it was, it was real like the real military, like the way they spoke at you. And uh, I, I ended up wetting my pants quite a few times. And... Yeah, Gotta you do know, then you it was, do. then it was, you know, they would stand you up in front and say, look at her shame. Look at what she did. Look at this disgusting thing she did. And it's like, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, <laughs> I mean, after yeah. school was over and we were all sent back to our individual dorms, first thing, there's lines for the bathroom. So I was not the only one. And then, uh. I had gotten sick and later on and had a fever and uh, it didn't go away for a couple of days. And they actually took me to a doctor in town named Twyla Spurlock. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I found out I had a serious uh, bladder infection. So uh, the, the, to a nurse practitioner, said, you know, gave me the pass that I could go to the bathroom when I needed. And I was beyond grateful for that because it was just, I mean, even going to the bathroom, being allowed to use the bathroom was, I mean, you had to beg for it. Were there, were there doors on the stalls and, and the showers? We had shower curtains in the showers, which there was never any hot water. I can't tell you how many cold, cold showers I had to take in seven minutes or less. <laughs> and, uh, the bathroom stalls, they all had uh, the doors on them with the latch, but I wasn't allowed to shut the door because I had I was still on double buddy. So I had literally two girls standing right there watching me do everything in the stall. And I kind of took it as, well, I'm not going to be ashamed of this. Is you want to see what I'm doing this year, I'm going to show you what I'm doing. You should have flung it at him. <laughs> Should have grabbed, oh, yeah. flung it at him. <laughs> I had thought about it. I, for, for the first month, I kind of stayed quiet and to myself and just watched. Because I had been in abusive situations before, like with my mother. And, and so I was kind of already prepared for it. Not entirely, but a little bit. And I watched. And you, you knew which girls were just completely brainwashed and which ones not to do anything in front of. And then there were the girls that were just smiling nodders. That's what we called them. You know, we were smiling nodders. It was, and uh, it was just, yes, sir. No, yes, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. And it was just go with the flow. Get out of here. Don't, don't rock the boat. Right. There was a ton of girls like that, and then there were just a handful like me that, you know, every time we had church, it was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah, uh-huh, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and he told me he'd break that finger one day. <laughs> and I'm like, you break my finger and watch what happens. Yeah. That's, and, a, that's uh, assault. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there was... Uh, Somebody threw a chair once. They, they uh, some girl lost it and threw a chair, and it damaged a wall. So, one of the few things personal items we were allowed to have was a, a picture of our parents and a stuffed animal, and that was basically it. And uh, and you got a King James Bible. Oh, of course. So the, the, your personal property, anything you brought with you, bracelets, makeup, jewelry of any kind other than a cross, forbidden, couldn't have it. And so I had my little stuffed monkey with me and, and a picture of my grandparents. And that's all I owned. Did, you know? the, the stuff that they took away from you, did they throw it away or did they say they were going to give it to you after you left? Well, when I got there and they were going through all of my bags and suitcases and everything, they took what was deemed appropriate 
and they boxed it all back up and my father took it back with oh, okay. him to West Palm Beach. Okay. And then anything that your parents or anyone sent to you while you were there, if you couldn't wear it, um, the upstairs small dorms like uh, Joy, Peace, and Love, they had uh, like attic closets with a little tiny door. Okay. And it was it was all alphabetized, and there would be a box with your name on it of things that you couldn't have, and that's where they would go. Okay. And that door had a deadbolt on it as well. <laughs> now you said that you were a a, a a not a little bit of a large girl back then. Yeah. Did they put you? Because I know a lot of them from the people I've talked to. Did they put you on some sort of special diet to say, oh, this girl's overweight or something, she needs to slim down a little bit? Or or was it just whatever you wanted? I was there for about two weeks, and breakfast is the same thing every day of the week. We had grits day, and I absolutely hated grits. Oh. I will not eat grits. They're disgusting. And uh, sorry, I love grits, but uh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> not their grits, <laughs> but maybe not their grits. You know, maybe the Texas grits. But go yeah, ahead. The uh, um, they yeah, it was it was probably two weeks, I think. And then they uh, they Palmer said something to all the girls after our knee and nails check, which was we'd all go to the main room and be in a big circle, and we'd have to be on our knees holding our hands out like this, and Miss Betty would go around and check your nails to see if you weren't chewing on them, if they were growing, and, and they had to be long, and your your uh, culottes, the lovely oh. culottes, oh. <laughs> or your skirt or your dress, when you were on your knees, it had to be touching the floor. So while we're all getting in a circle, certain girls are lowering their, their what they're wearing so it will hit the floor. <laughs> And that's when she would go around and, and look, and she'd be like, you're on halves without dessert, and you're on halves without dessert, and you're on halves without dessert. And then there was one girl there who was, I believe, bulimic or anorexic, and it says, you're on full tray, and you're going to eat the full tray. And so I went there weighing roughly plus or minus 180 pounds, when I left, I weighed 110. Yeah. Wow. And stress has a lot to do with it as well. Oh, yeah, it does. Yes. Yes. Man. Culottes. Just so you mentioned <laughs> culottes. I hate culottes. The culottes oh. should be considered a dirty word. I'm telling uh, you. I, oh. They're Listen, a crime against humanity. They're an abomination. <laughs> they're They're... Because this is, you know, when I went to the school, uh, the roll-off farm, the Rebecca girls had to wear culottes when they went out to play or PE yeah, or whatever. Yep. There were these ugly pink, faded pink culottes. Oh, just, just disgusting, just unattractive. <laughs> really weird flower prints. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, they were. Awful. They were not good. <laughs> and we only got to wear those because on Saturdays we were allowed to go outside and play sports. And there's soccer and softball. And I I always ended up playing softball because I had buddies with me. And it was so funny because I'd be at bat and I'd hit the ball and they'd run behind me. <laughs> like like well, I'm going to run the bases and just take off down yeah. the road. <laughs> Wow. And, but I mean, even that wasn't fun because y you weren't allowed to talk while you were playing. I mean, it was, I, yeah. I think what they did that for was for the people driving by to say, oh, look, they're all outside playing. Isn't that nice? Look how well behaved they are. They're not yelling or screaming. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's what it really was, was a ploy because... There were plenty of other places we could have done all that out of sight. But we made he made sure we did it all right in front of the building. And I, I thought about that once and I was like, that that's what he was doing. Yeah. That, yeah, that that sounds plausible. 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Just put on a good show for the Yeah, for all the passers citizens. by. Yeah. So when you were there and let's say a new girl comes in with her parents, did Palmer say, Hey, girls need to shut up, just don't say anything, act normal or whatever, or don't act normal. But just you know, act like you're having a good time. Basically, did, did he forewarn you? Basically, before anybody else came in, adults. Yes, yes. Usually, it was Miss Betty. She she was the one that kind of direct dealt with us directly the most. Mm -hmm. And um, they had a a big bell, like something you'd see from a. An old farm, it was a big bell, really loud, and they would ring it, and then we had so many minutes to be in the hall. When we heard it while we were doing our different things, that meant stop what you're doing and go to the hall. So go there and be like, we have a new arrival coming. No one is to notice her. No one is to speak. And like, okay, here comes another one. Here's the routine. And we'd be sent back to the laundry room or the kitchen where I always got put. And, uh, you know, they, she'd come in. And I, I remember one girl coming in and just, like, being in the kitchen for the first time. And she just out and out said, I don't understand all this. What's, what's going on? And then her helper jumped on top of her oh and put her on the floor and... <laughs> <laughs> and says, you do not speak unless spoken to, and there is no adult here, no one is speaking to you, and your opinion doesn't matter, and you're here to do the dishes, and dry the dishes, and make the food, and, you know, you're not, yeah. you're not allowed to speak, and, oh. and then they'd start crying, and, and kicking, and fighting, and then more girls would come and jump on them, and if it got too bad, you know, they'd pin them until staff came, and then they're go to the get right room. And there was one girl in particular, um, she came in and uh, later we found out she was from Hawaii. Mm. And it was uh, the second day of her being there. She, it was either, I think it was breakfast or lunch. She had come down and we had these god awful orange prison trays. That's what they served our food on. And she came from the kitchen down the stairs to the dining hall and she just slammed it on the floor and it shattered and went everywhere. And she goes, this is what I think of your fucking food. And, <laughs> and immediately oh. they, um, brother Kissel grabbed her by her hair, which was pretty long. And of course she grabbed his arm and then two other girls right away without even being told to do anything, grabbed her legs and off into his office they went. And no one saw her for about four days. And then she finally reappeared. And up until the day I left, all I ever saw that poor girl do was kneel in front of a window and pray and cry. She never spoke. She got off Buddy real quick. But, I mean, I don't know what happened in those four days in that room. But whatever it was, it was enough to destroy her that quickly. They broke her. Yeah. Yeah, mentally, probably. Mm -hmm. oh, it's sad, sad situation. Very. Oh. Very. I mean, I, I think the, the worst thing that they did to me, well, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a ton of things they did to me, but one of the worst, um, when it was time to speak, you know, we had speaking times, mm -hmm. um, and I talked to my different helpers. It's always negative. You know, I hate this place. I want to go home. I want to get out of here. You know, I want a cigarette. <laughs> you know, anything. <laughs> yeah, I want to know. I, I I wasn't swearing anymore because that just got you in more lines and more trouble. Right. And it just it wasn't worth it. So I was kind of. All right, I'll play your little game, but I'm not going to pretend to be happy about it. And this girl looked at me, it was my helper, and, and she's just like, we're going to have you silenced. I'm like, what is that? And she says, because the helpers, one night of the week, 
I'm not, I can't remember what day it was, but they'd all would get together with Miss Betty and Miss Kessel in the one living room area that no one was allowed to go into. It was off, off limits to us. And they would have their little sessions where the helpers would report all the little things girls were doing. And after that meeting, you know, Miss Betty would come out and ring the bell and we'd all be in the, the big room together. Okay. And she'd list off names and, you know, hand out lines and punishments and you're back on buddy and take away just anything and everything we had. And she got to me last and she's like, you are being silenced for a week. And I'm like, what does that mean? And then she pulled a piece of, she pulled a roll of duct tape out of her pocket. Oh man. And they put silver duct tape right here over my mouth. And they said it can come off when you eat and when you're in the shower. And when it wouldn't stick anymore, they put a new piece on there. And it was just, I mean, I, I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. And I, it, that was my lowest point was that, I mean, to physically not be able to talk. I mean, it just, it really messed with me. I'm like, these people are fucking nuts. I humans mean, who hu- does this humans are social creatures you know we we have to interact with with others you know and to be silenced where you're not talking to anybody that's yeah and you physically can't yeah that's that's abuse and, that's abuse <laughs> you know i mean it, it is it that blew my mind and that 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 brought me down quite a bit i i was i was messed up after that incident i started to lose any hope at all about getting out or being normal again. Right. And, you know, it was seven days to the day, and my helper said, you know, can, when, when can Nicole remove the tape, Miss Betty? And it says, Nicole will no longer be silenced at 5 o'clock p.m. And that was it. There was no happy cheers or yay. It was just, you know, keep eating your lunch. Yeah. <laughs> you know what would have been kind of funny is, is right after they took the tape off, he just looked at her and goes, "Fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> well, I want tape to. back on. The other I week, wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to. I really wanted to <laughs> so bad. I mean, there were times I had to go to the bathroom. I wanted to kick the door open. Yeah, but it, it was just you. Just you. Just have this thing in the back of your head. There's no escape. There's no one coming for you. No one knows where you are. And it, the more you fight the system, the worse it is. Yeah. So certain things you just learned how to go with the flow just to avoid being screamed at or floored or hit or put in the get right room. Because it was just the the more you fought and yelled and screamed, the, the worse it was for you. And was, it, was, was the staff all female or were there males there besides, of course, Palmer? Uh, yeah, there was Brother Kissel. Um, there was um, Miss, I can't remember his name. It was Miss Betty's husband. Um, outside of Faith Dorm, on the one side, there was a, a big camper trailer, the kind you'd pull with a dually truck. Mm-hmm. There, was, there was a family that lived in there. It was a woman, a man, and I think their two kids. And the lady had had her daughter. We, we did the math one day because she said how old she was and how old her daughter was. And she had had her daughter when she was like 13. Oh. And, and she was getting ready to go off to a Christian college. And her husband was there. And he was raised in the same kind of place. And he went to a pace school. And he stuttered. And he was really soft spoken and it was like he was the only one that I ever thought I could talk to or reach because it was kind of it's kind of like he didn't buy it or or he knew you know it was just a feeling when you saw him talk but I can't remember their names so there were there was a yeah there was about four or five guys 
and then the rest of they were all female miss Disney was the 500 pound woman in the kitchen and there was this old mexican woman they made us call abuela which is grandmother in spanish right i never really saw her there's miss betty palmer's wife mrs kissel there was an, another woman who was supposed to be the english teacher <laughs> i can't remember her name um there was miss rosa and another spanish lady and then there was this big tall fat bull dyke lesbian looking woman who was meaner than hell i can't remember her name either Ugh. but what was interesting is you know I, after i left years later i found out they opened up a place in mexico yeah on the internet and uh the the younger hispanic lady was in faith thorm and she was there getting trained on how to run a place okay and then the other woman was the same thing and uh when they opened genesis by the sea that's where these two women went was to run the facility because they were getting trained at bca by palmer himself mm. to go run a new shop well the reason why i ask is because uh you know, when you get a a, a home or a tr troubled teen home or boarding school whatever when you have male staff, that's never good because from what I've learned about, you know, Christian leaders and teachers is either one of two things. They don't pay their taxes <laughs> or they like to fondle little girls. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Miss Betty's, Miss, yeah, Miss Betty's husband, every so often you'd see him standing behind a girl and he'd have his hands on her shoulders it's kind of, you know, yeah. like, oh, I'm praying for you. Mm. I'm praying yeah. my ass. Yeah. And there was a, Palmer's office and I guess the house, because I, I never really saw more than just the office part, was separate from the main building, but it was just like right there. It was like garage distance away. And at random, you know, Miss Betty was like, you need to go to go to Palmer's office. And she'd unlock the door and you'd trot over there. And none of us ever knew why. And there mm. was a girl there named Erin who was very small and a little bit younger than I was. And she had a Grover doll that she just adored. And we had learned to take little tiny bits of paper and micro write on them. Okay. And then we'd, we'd give each other this look with our eyes. And we would go to the bathroom and sneak you know under the the next stall door these little notes and then aaron had given me this note and it was the first one was don't be alone with michael palmer and then we'd flush the notes down the toilet so no one could find them and then she sent me another one and it says you know he he touches me and he wants me to do things and it like slowly, you know, through whispers and just little hidden, like it was almost like a code mm -hmm. for the ones of us that knew and we didn't want to be there. And it just, you know, eventually got worked around. And, and I'd heard of a couple of girls had been raped by him. And when I heard that, I was just, wow. like, this is. And and there was there was no oversight. There was no social workers coming in. There was no, you know, police or fire inspections. There was there was nobody. And there was this corner. It was a, one of those cards from the fire department that says legal legal capacity. Well, we were like ten girls over legal capacity. And we were all hoping to death one day the fire department would show up and pick 10 of us to leave. <laughs> yeah. Well, being that they weren't licensed by the state, the state wouldn't intervene. Yeah. yeah I didn't know any of that mm. until I researched it later on. And I'm like, so they, these people could literally have done anything to us and no one would know. Yep. No one would know. And I mean, then I started thinking about all the, the backhands and the slaps across the face and 
And I'm just like, nobody knows. And none of the girls really got visits. And, you know, I heard, I got letters from my grandmother and that was it. You know, and then there's the forced letter writing twice a week. He had to write some wonderful, smiley, happy letter. And if it wasn't good enough, Miss Betty would send it back and you rewrite your letter. You know, tell him the truth about how happy you are. And Well, the, know, reason, the, the reason why they were blocking it out is because you were telling the truth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, just lie to him. Just tell him yeah. that everything's good. Yeah. Were, were your, That's, was your dad paying for you to be there? Um, I later on found out um, what had happened is it was $2,000 a month for me to be there. And since my parents were divorced, he told my mother, you're going to pay for half of it. So it was $1,000 a month from each of them. And, you know, that's how I got there. And, mm. Too bad. Yeah, yeah, too bad. There's not a hell for Palmer to go to. So, yeah. Well, I found out he was dead, and I was angry because I'd finally gotten the courage to look this stuff up and find other survivors and you. And I was like, "Damn it! I wanted to slap him in the face so bad and just." A lot, a lot of people believe that justice was not served because he yeah. died. He died. He died. All his secrets went with him. Yeah. You know? Ah. Yeah, they did. And all the girls, like that one girl you talk about, Aaron, or whatever, you know, her story died with him, basically. You know? Yeah. It's her word against his. You know what I mean? So it's like, he's dead. What can you do? You can't, exactly. you can't send him to prison. Yeah, so. it was it was normally it was it wasn't like the pretty girls or the the big girls. It seemed to be all the girls that who were like 12, 13, 14 but were small in stature and the quiet ones. The shy ones, yeah. Those were the ones that were getting molested. And I mean, well, you'd hear them cry at night. Every night there was always somebody crying. There's always somebody who just, you know, couldn't keep it together. And then if it, you, you were warned once to knock it off and go to sleep. And then if you didn't and you persisted, then you woke up to a whole, you know, you're on floor scrubbing duty and you're going to write 5,000 lines about, you know, right. keeping people awake at night with mm. my, your useless emotional babble. <laughs> usually, usually, like uh, like you said before, the shy ones, the quiet ones, mm-hmm. if something like that happens, they basically will clam up and keep it to themselves. Yeah. You don't want those yeah. loud ones, the loud, boisterous ones, because as soon as it happens, they're going to be telling everybody. Oh, if, if, if I had gotten sent to his mm-hmm. office. And he did that. And he tried to touch me. I'd have done everything in my power to kill him. I'd have been grabbing pens, pencils, chairs, anything yeah. heavy. I mean, because, no, you're not going to do me like that. That's why he wanted the small, petite, shy ones. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was really strange because he always had Tootsie Pop uh, suckers mm-hmm. in his back pocket. Every so often... He'd stop and look at a girl and give her that god awful goofy grin. And he'd pull one out of his pocket and go like that and hand it to him. And he'd always make a big deal out of it so he knew the other girls were noticing. And it, that just struck me as weird. And that was kind of like how I validated he's doing something. Right. You know, I was like, he's not. Yeah, you know, I started to think. Yeah, they they're not just getting touched. There's there's something serious going he had, on. He had his his special ones, the ones that he always, yeah his favorites. Yeah, and then he had his favorites to pick on and humiliate, which was me <laughs> and a handful of other girls. And he would concoct entire sermons, and then there was the if sermon. <laughs> And he went on and on about disobedience and, 
you know, the man says so, kind of just all the fire brimstone crap, you're going to hell, you're a whore, and, and all that. And then he read some verse out of the Bible, and he says, he, he says, Nicole and two other girls, I can't remember who it was, and he says, what does that whole verse hinge on? What word in the entire verse, you know, makes it what it is? You know, I want to see if you're smart enough to figure it out. And it's like, you, and like love, and you, and hope, me, Hell. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, yeah, he looks right at me and he says, if, if is the word, if you get out of here, if I let you leave, you know, and, and I'm like, dude. 1201 you know on my birthday in august if i am not allowed to leave out those doors i'm gonna hurt hurt people i was planning my 18th birthday and you know i let my helpers know i said the day before my birthday i'm gonna have everything to go and 1201 if they don't open those doors and let me walk away i said someone's gonna have to kill me because i was getting out i mean i was this this it, it's it's so nuts when you try to ex explain it to somebody who hasn't been there you don't get believed because yeah. nobody wants to believe that things like this happen and that's why i've never really talked about it because when i do it's you know it's like oh you're yeah, that couldn't have been that bad. And, you know, it was, well, it was religion, you know, religion strict. And it's like, no. no, this is like radical Islamic behavior. They're terrorists. I mean, there's no difference. I mean, I mean, if they wanted to be like the, they would have been one step closer to Islam if they had just put everybody in a long dress and covered their face. And yeah, it's like <laughs> hand out hijabs and yeah. Yeah. And you would have I mean, been Islam, you know, so it's it's the same they have the same god it's basically i i believe basically the same religion yeah it's just I different mean, different uh different uh, styles of worship yeah, different traditions yeah yeah different yeah. ways of dressing and everything yeah that's all yeah so it is but i don't know, know it's just mind blowing <laughs> yeah and like i said I, I i didn't go to the school i just i went to the he had a regular school behind the Rebecca home. That's where I went, but I saw everything. So whenever I have the girls come up to me and say, Hey, this, I believe you. I 100% believe you. Cause I saw it happen. You can see the look of just sorrow and shame yeah. in these girls eyes as they walk past you because we, we'd be out there playing kickball or whatever. And some of the Rebecca girls would walk by and you just look at their face. It's like they were dead. They were dead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was a whole slew that just this, the, the smile and nodders that were just so crushed and dead inside. It's yeah. just, you know, it was, it was literally like counting out your sentence in prison. It was just, okay, another day, get dressed, smile. It took everything you, know. you had to smile. You know what I mean? They took, they, it wasn't just that, they literally took everything from you. They, they took your clothes, your style, your jewelry, and they dignity. took everything but your first name. Yeah, your dignity. And you, you were stripped down to just your basics, and there was no music, no TV, no movies, no, they well, back have, then there was no cell phones. They didn't have sermons <laughs> playing? Uh, yeah, we'd have the cassette tape played Lester every Roloff, so often, sure. and it was, <laughs> you know, we were very well aware who Lester Roloff was, and, and, and we'd have those when, when, when they didn't have a sermon prepared, it was the press play sermons. Yeah. And, but some of the girls, I mean, to this day, I mean, it was, you know, when, when we were outside of the dorms, you know, it was yes ma'am yes sir right away but inside of the dorms it was just sunken death it was like their soul had just been killed 
and it just I my thing was I certainly ain't gonna be a helper. Not I'm not gonna you know aid and assist these people, but I'm not gonna let it kill me either. And it wasn't until I got out that I had realized how much it had affected me. I mean, I was messed up for a number of years because of it, and I still am to this day. I won't wear I won't wear, I won't wear skirts. I won't wear dresses. I don't wear women's clothing. Period. Other than you know, a bra and underwear. No culottes. <laughs> no, no culottes. <laughs> no culottes. <laughs> You know, I have I have problems being around churches. I have problems being around religious people. It's it it's it just it's like a floodgate opens up in my head, and all of this just comes pouring out so fast that it's hard to remember at all. Right. And after seeing how Michael Palmer was, and all the other staff members, and they consider and they call themselves Christians. Yeah. You know, and then you look at some other people who are probably truly sincere, you know what I mean? But with what you've experienced, you look at them and automatically the trust is gone. You know? Oh, yeah. They, they could be, like I said, completely trustworthy and sincere and not know anything about what was going on over there. But in your mind, being what you experienced, the trust is gone. I can't trust you. You're a Christian. And... A lot of a lot of people to this day still have that. I have that. You know, yeah. every time I see a, a like I said, every time I see a pastor, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's first? Are they going to catch him fondling some kid, or is he going to be hit for tax evasion? Something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's going to happen sooner or later. Yep. Uh, so maybe one of these days, when they shut these schools down, or at least get them regulated and licensed. You know, <laughs> that maybe the trust might come back. It may take a while, but I don't see it happening. I don't, I don't either. And, you know, the, the, I've had a couple other people besides you reach out and tell me that these places are up and running under different names, apparently by the Cookstons. And it just made my stomach hurt. I mean, well, that's I, what, that's what they do. You know, if, if they're in a state that's not regulated or they don't have to have a license and then all of a sudden there's, you know, abuse going on and the state finds yep. out, they pass a law to make them get a license while well, they move to another state that's not licensed. Yeah, they just keep going and out. they keep going and they keep going. Yeah, so when I was in my 20s, I found out it originated in California, shut down. Yeah. I went to I, Texas, I think, for boys, shut down. And then there's one I was at in Florida, and then the one in Mexico shut down and shut down. Yep. And I'm just like, I used to dream, you know, I had a, a roommate who became a really close friend of mine when I was in my early, early 20s. And I said, you know, I just want to drive down there and drive my car right through that dining hall <laughs> and make a big hole and just start honking the horn and just say, Everybody, run! <laughs> You're free. And when everybody's yeah, just, out with the Molotov just, cocktail, just yeah, throw. just <laughs> just stuff as many girls in there as I could, and just get them out. And yeah. you know, it, you know, it's it's been twenty plus years since I've been there, and you know, up until recently, I thought the one in Jay, Florida, was still running. I had no idea Michael Palmer was dead, his wife was dead, and it just ate away at me. You know, and I put it in a box in the back of my head, and everyone's always just forget about it. You deserved right. it, and you know I find your show and so many others, and I'm just like, it wasn't okay. Yeah. I don't have to hide this. I shouldn't have to deal with this. It was wrong what was done to me. I mean, the the physical abuse, the psychological abuse. I mean, right. It, and and it just, even though even though victory is. Or, or Palmer's dead. I believe Victory Christian Academy. I believe it's closed, and you it said is. it's closed. And even though it's closed, if you have parents that are that are thinking about sending their kids to a school, and they see, well, this place was closed for abuse or whatever. Okay, what about this place? And they'll look. Oh, there's abuse going on there. You know, and and 
I mean, yeah, they and, shouldn't and, be sending their kids to those schools to begin with. <laughs> no, I mean, in, in my case, it was it was psychological problems. I was I was right. a virgin until I was twenty. I had never drank, never done drugs, never ran away. I was a straight A student in college prep classes, and my thing was coming from an abused situation to Florida to my father and his wife who didn't know how to raise a child or even really interact with a child because they hadn't had any of their own yet. And I needed real psychological help. And I, I think this was the cheapest option for my father because he owned his own business and didn't have insurance. So mm -hmm. for me to actually go to a proper place would have bankrupt him. And it's like, well, this is a cheap option, and my wife won't come home until she's gone, so that's where you're going. Right. And, you know, to this day, I hear from him twice a day, my birthday and Christmas, twice a year. Twice a year. And, uh, you know, he'll send me $50, and I call it guilt money, because he's my father in name only. He, he doesn't visit. He doesn't write. He doesn't call. And, and, uh, and your, your stepmother or your mother? My stepmother. Stepmother. She doesn't talk to you at all? No. No. She will have nothing to do with me. And my my father moved to Oklahoma, and my grandmother lived with my father in Florida in her own place. But she's 78 years old now, and she didn't want to be alone in Florida, so she moved to Oklahoma with my father, and she lives in a very nice building. I haven't seen my grandmother in 20 years. Hmm. Because my stepmother told my father to tell me I'm not welcome in the state of Oklahoma. That she's afraid of me. And I'm like, okay, what did I do for you to be afraid of me? And it's, it's, it's all the stuff the psychiatrists and everything said to her. And, you know, she, she took one psychology course before she dropped out of college. So, of course, she's a psychiatrist. <laughs> And yep. yeah, and so she gave she put my father in kind of an ultimatum situation. It's kind of, who do you love more, me and our newborn son, or your mistake of a daughter you had with a woman you hate, you know, when you were a teenager? And it was an easy choice, you know, just get rid of me. And I well, and we don't have really any kind of relationship at all. Coming from a uh, a parent like me, that is not an easy choice. And if it was an easy choice for him, then that's sad. Because if oh, any, yeah. anybody, to, any, any, if I, you know, if I, I'm married, my wife, I, you know, I've been with her for 27 years, you know, and if she ever said, is it you or your daughter, go, you're done. I'm not, you know, that's my blood. That's my flesh and blood right there. I can't do that. You know what I mean? That's not, a, not that's with not, mine. It's not even a hard decision to make right there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not with mine. I mean, yeah. it, he yeah. I I came back to Illinois and here here's an example for you. Okay. I came back to Illinois and I was still really pissed off at him, but I was like, you know, he called for my birthday. And there's a baby crying in the background. And my little brother, who had been born while I was there, was about three or four years old. And I'm like, that's not, you know, my brother. He's too too old to be crying like that. And I said, well, that's the, you know, I'll call him John. And I'm like, who's John? Was, well, that's your brother. I'm like, you had another baby? I didn't even know she was pregnant, my stepmother. I was never even told. This baby was six months old, and no one bothered to tell me or say you have another brother or anything. You know, it was a it was a bullshit birthday phone call. Hi, how you doing? Love you. Goodbye. Sent you a birthday card, some money in it, and I happened to hear the baby in the background, and you know, ask him about it, and you know, it was just <laughs> so she got pregnant. Had the baby, and six months later, and finally, you know that that's how much he cared. You know these these places, being Christian places, supposed to bring the family family together. No, it, it destroys them to shreds. Yeah, it tears it did. them to ribbons. Yeah, it destroys them. 
It did. I, I, I don't have any relationship with my mother. It's been six years since I've seen her. And, you know, it's, it's been 20 plus years since I've seen my father. And uh, he didn't even call me the last birthday I had. And it just, I don't know. It's just, for me, it's just like, like my therapist, you know, he says, well, what if we could, you know, arrange a conversation about this and, and, and open discussion and not be hostile about it? And I've welcomed that. I have welcomed that to the nth degree to the point where I've had my therapist call my father and say, can we set up a day for an hour for just to talk on speakerphone and just kind of resolve this? Right. There's nothing to resolve. <clears throat> and I'm just like, see, he doesn't care. <laughs> it was the easiest way out for him. And unfortunately, it, it, it did a number on me and my brain. It really did. No, no doubt. And that's, that's a choice. I believe in the long run, they will regret. I hope they do. They will. I, I, I think they will. I mean, I'm, I'm single. I have no children other than my dog. <laughs> and it's, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have really any faith in God just cause it just, it just, it ruins all of that for yes. you. Yes. Yes. It just takes it away from you. And, you know, it's just, it's like you said, it's it, not, it, 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 it hurt, you know, it destroys your soul, uh, you, you know, your, your dignity, your self, your self esteem, everything. Yeah. They, they take it all away. Yeah. And you're left with nothing. Yeah. It wasn't until uh, the <clears throat> ISIS stuff started when I started to learn about fundamentalist Islam, basically. And that's when I discovered that, you know, okay, well, there's good Islamics and bad ones and ones that blow themselves up. And it says, it, basically what it comes down to for me is, is it a perversion of religion? Is it, you know, it's just a perversion of whatever religion to get what you want. And in Michael Palmer's case, it was power, control, money. It was all, look at me and what I'm doing and... And just just destroying people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you didn't conform to whatever his mold was made for you, then you didn't exist. Yeah. And that's that right there is the Baptist religion. Yeah. I believe. I believe. That's like I said, I grew up Southern Baptist. I know. Yeah. It's, it's all about power. Whether it's controlled through Psychological abuse, sexual abuse, or whatever. It's all about power. And it's all about robbing you blind and taking your money. And they, yeah. they robbed your dad blind. They robbed him. Oh, yeah. And my, my mother, unfortunately. Yeah, they, they, they robbed her, too. It was a big heist is what it was. Yeah, it was a big lie. When I was, when I was there, I want to say there was close to or just over 200 of us. I mean, this place was jam-packed to yeah. the point that in every single dorm, they had, like, this little kid's chair that would fold out flat. And there were girls that had to sleep on that on the floor. And then at night, you had one helper sleeping on the floor on a decent mattress right in front of the door. So if you, ha you went out the door, you had to, like, step on her and wake her up. And it's just, yeah. it's just so crazy. It's just really crazy. Two hundred girls and let's you know two thousand a month. Let's say that's a lot yeah. of money. That's a lot a of lot money of coming money. in. Yeah, I yeah. mean, one of the big reasons is for me doing this was because the things on TV about the Boy Scouts. You know, if you were abused in a tent by Scoutmaster Tom seventy years ago, please call. I don't want to be that person in my seventies or eighties. Seeing a commercial about that, about Victory Christian Academy victims, please call. It's like there's got to be a way to unite, the, you know, the the eighties girls, the nineties girls, the two, all of us, get us yeah. all together. And if there's a lawyer watching and listening, find us because 
I don't see why we cannot file a class action lawsuit against the Baptist Church. I mean, they're doing it with the Catholic priests that have been fondling children for eternity. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's not going to stop until, you know, they, they hit them in the wallet. Yep. Yeah, that's what I've learned. You want to hurt somebody? Don't punch them in the face. Take their money. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Once they find their money start to get sapped out of their wallets, they'll be like, okay, all right, let's damage control, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, hit them, hit them it, where it hurts. And, it's, and for me, it's not really even about, you know, oh, if I get $10, it's not the point. The money is not the point for me. It's national recognition that these places exist and people need to know. People need to know where they're sending their children to. They're, they're, I mean, it's, it's the, the facility I was at was beautiful. And pecan trees, big sprawling white fence, beautiful yeah. pool in the back, a spiral staircase, a new addition, all the staff were, hi, how are you? It's right. so nice. And, were, were you ever and, in the pool? No. 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 <laughs> no. They, they, since I was on Double Buddy when, when PE time was uh, for the first few months, I wasn't allowed to go outside with the other girls and run around the pecan trees because they thought I'd hop the fence and, you know, run away. So I got to go in the back deck where the pool was and there were steps and it was up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down for 25 minutes. <laughs> And, it, and you had to keep pace with the other, with the helpers right. and the other girl that was with me. And then I just said one day to myself, this is ridiculous. I'm going to throw myself in the pool and drown myself. So then I couldn't go out back to the pool and do the up, up, down, down thing right. anymore. I got sent to the laundry room to do jumping jacks. Oh. <laughs> did, did any of the girls get to go into the pool? I mean, did you see any of the girls in the pool? It was October when I got okay. there, so it was a little cooler. And then I, it was the end of March, beginning of April. So no, nobody got to use the pool when I was there because it was, it was too cold. And well, I'm beginning to wonder what if they had gone into the pool. What oh, were they wearing? I, you know, I mean, are, oh, yeah. are they wearing culottes to jump in the pool? I mean, you know. Yeah, I'm full, yeah if I had jumped in. Because I wasn't allowed to wear culottes except on Saturdays because, you know, I was the troublemaker. Right. And so they kept me in full-length skirts and tights and button-up shirts and all the other wonderful things. And, I mean, if I had jumped in a pool, I probably would have drowned just from the weight of the clothing. Yeah. And, but, you know, I, I thought about it. I literally legitimately thought, you know. I could jump in there and just inhale and be done with all this. I mean, it it was that bad. I mean, you know, my, my current roommate is 69 years old and, you know, he lived a very happy family, good life and everything. And, you know, I tried to explain to him what I was doing with you today. And he just doesn't understand. And that's what I find with most people is you start talking and it's just there, all of a sudden it's like this wall gets built and it's like, yeah, you 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 were there, but you were there because you were bad. You it right. wasn't that bad. No religion does that to children. Yeah, they and, have this. They have this picture. Oh, well, they're Christians. I mean, it can't be that bad. You know, they're following Jesus's teachings. They, sh they should be good people. You know? Yeah, and that's not the case. That's no, not, case. not at all. Usually, they're the worst ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, I do have one funny story out of the whole place, and every time I think about it, it makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, New Year's Eve. They bring out this, I mean, large wooden cross, and it's got holes drilled into it, and it's okay. kind of at a 45-degree angle built on this thing. <laughs> and Barker. And, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. That's dog. all right. It's okay. <laughs> And uh, what it was is we all got a little white candle uh -huh. 
and um, one at a time, and it was all the helpers first, and and then it was you know the helpers that had buddies, and they weren't even going to let me do it. That was the funny part. But I was like, but I'm, what, I'm not going to do anything with a candle. So they let me do it. <laughs> and one at a time, row by row, you got to go up there. You were given your candle. And they'd light it. And then you'd stick it in one of these holes in this giant wooden, goofy-looking cross thing. And you could say your, your, th- your, your prayer for the new year, out loud or in person, quiet to yourself. And you go sit back down. Okay. Well, there's... 200 girls here so the candles started to go real quick and that goddamn cross caught on fire oh (laughs) it caught on fire real quick and like the whole top and the this part just were like flames and i was sitting there like burn burn get us out of here (laughs) call the fire department catch the curtains on fire right and and so right away they were smacking it, trying to get it to go out, and they're like, "Oh crap! Uh, water!" No fire <laughs> extinguishers. Throw all this water on the cross. They didn't have any fire extinguishers. No, I mean there were some through through through. Oh, well, where'd you go? Yeah, there, there were go. some throughout the building, but but no, nobody went and got a fire extinguisher. They tried to smack it at first, and then right. it got bigger. And then somebody went and got some water in a glass and just threw it on. Oh, <laughs> hey, quiet. I'm going to let her out so she can be quiet. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I have a dog myself. There you go, baby. But yeah, it was, that was the, the funniest thing. I mean, I was so I, I was grinning ear to ear when that cross caught on fire. You were so hoping. Just... Yeah, it, it was burnt to the point that they needed to replace it. They had to rebuild one because it was it was just hilarious. And it wasn't just like a little. I mean, it was, it was big. I mean, the flames were touching the ceiling. Oh, man. <laughs> like the whole time, there was just a whole bunch of us going, burn. but it didn't happen no it didn't (laughs) not until years later unfortunately Uh, yeah (laughs) well nicole that was was probably the best fun (laughs) this has been great thanks for coming on this is thanks for telling your story oh thank you for having me yeah it's uh, I haven't laughed at like that in a while. <laughs> With all the burn, baby, burn. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Any, anyone who was so, there in, in the nineties, I don't know if they continued that tradition or what. But when that cross caught fire, it was just well. They probably was, they probably did it outside after that. I'm sure. Uh, probably. I mean, who's the who's <laughs> the dumbass that wanted it done inside, especially with fire? You know, candles. Yeah, it, and they were they were like maybe you know candles that long, and it's yeah. like you know by the time you got to the girls at the back, they burnt down to nothing, <laughs> and it was kind of like <laughs> wow. so. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the podcast, Nicole. Stay on the line, okay? Okay. And then I'll talk to you a little bit. Um, everybody, I want to thank Nicole for coming on. This has been a great podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. If, you, if you're new to the channel, please uh, give it a thumbs up and uh, comment. All right. So for the Hammer Podcast, I'm Jason. You take care of yourself and you take care of each other. Yep. That's right.